So again, welcome everyone. Hard to believe we're down to our last two lectures. We made it, <laughs> as I say this, this semester, but it truly has been a privilege and an honor putting this together for you and uh, moderating it, you all, with and have made it such a fun experience for myself with your great questions and your impressions and thoughts afterwards. So I wanna thank you for that as well. All right, well, we're gonna go ahead and get started then. And so please let me introduce our speaker, Vincent Tolentino from the Frick Collection. Or is it the Frick? It's the Frick, okay. Um, Vincent um, Tolentino has been a mu museum educator at the Frick Collection since 2015. He is also a faculty associate in narrative medicine at Columbia University and a master's of fine arts candidate and instructor in creative writing at New York University. His writing has appeared in The Margins, which is an Asian American writer's workshop and elsewhere. And he has received fellowships from the Yale Center for British Art, the Martha's Vineyard Institute of Creative Writing and Sulu, the Philippine Studies Initiative at NYU. So this morning we welcome you, Vincent. Thank you so much for being a part of our guest lecture series and it's all yours. Thanks so much, Shiva Marie, and, and thank you to you all for being here. It's really lovely to be part of this series. Uh, lovely to be joining you on a Friday afternoon here in New York, Friday morning there in California. Um, as I say, it's a beautiful day here in New York. Maybe we can share some of this New York sunshine with you, oddly enough. Um, today is going to be uh, a kind of revisit of the Frick. Um, I know that you you spent some time looking at some works of art with Olivia Birkeland, the, the wonderful Olivia Birkeland, um, who's one of my colleagues. Um, today we'll be doing a kind of... Um, uh, diving back into the collection and walking around. So that's the kind of the the, the new the new part of <laughs> the new aspect of today's visit uh, is that we'll have the the chance to explore the Frick's 360 degree virtual tour. Uh, in addition to seeing a lot of a lot of other kind of treasures in the collection and, and diving deeply into them, uh, exploring some some great details with with thanks to the the Frick's uh, photography department, uh, which supplies really wonderful high resolution images for us to explore. Um, we've been finding on Zoom actually over the past few years that um, you can see certain things on Zoom that you can't actually see in person. So I uh, hope to share some of that kind of um, uh, insight with you today. Um, please do drop questions in the chat as we or in the Q&A as we, as we go along, um, and we'll save time at the end to, to have a little bit of a discussion. Um, I'll be sharing my screen throughout the hour. We'll be walking through the Frick's virtual tour, which is um, always available to you on, on the Frick's website. Um, if you go to frick.org, um, and just uh, look for the virtual tour. You can you can always go back in and do this yourself as well. Okay, all right. So I'll sh I'll start sharing my screen and we'll, we'll get started. Great. So here we are, <laughs> the Frick collection. This is a 1927 photograph uh, of the Frick Mansion uh, before it was a museum, actually. So um, a, a bit of history about the, the collection itself. So the, the Frick is called uh, the Frick because of an individual named Henry Clay Frick, uh, who was a turn of the century steel industrialist. He made a huge fortune in coal cake and coke uh, at the end of the 19th century. Um, exactly the right industry to be getting into at the end of the 19th century. He was partners with Andrew Carnegie whose name you might know. Um, he was chairman of Carnegie Steel at one point, CEO of Carnegie Steel. Uh, so one of the very wealthiest men of, of the Gilded Age in, in New York City and in Pittsburgh, which is where he was starting to make his money. Like many of his colleagues, like many of his contemporaries, robber barons, as they're, as they're now sometimes uh, described in, in our history books, um, Frick is an intensely complicated individual, uh, in, specifically in terms of his labor practices. Um, he got into a lot of trouble, uh, a lot of hot water over his, his kind of um, rather ruthless business practices. Um, uh, most famously, there was the Homestead Strike of 1892, which you might uh, have come across in your U.S. history, um, sometimes called the Battle of Homestead. Workers at one of the steel plants that Frick managed in Homestead, Pennsylvania, were striking for, for better wages, better working conditions. Um, and Henry Clay Frick rather infamously hired uh, a private armed security force known as the Pinkertons to break up that strike. So the Pinkertons went to the picket line uh, with their rifles in tow. Um, a battle broke out. Um, nine of the strikers were killed. Uh, I think one of the Pinkertons was also killed, uh, a very 
very bloody incident and kind of uh, a major turning point, I think, in the history of labor organization in this country. I think that um, after that, uh, that, that, that battle, uh, I think Americans saw the extent to which businessmen like Henry Clay Frick would go to quash labor uprising to kind of keep the the presses running to keep the kind of factory um and you know moving um so once upon a time there were national headlines um that ran you know describing henry clay frick as the most hated man in america um i, I think it's just really fascinating to think about that specific history and to think about frick's legacy uh now in 2023 because i think that nowadays when you hear the name frick in new york city you tend not to think of that labor history you tend to think of uh, Vermeer and Rembrandt and Velasquez and Turner, all the treasures that are housed in this uh, museum. Um, so I, I just invite you to, to see this as very much a, a living uh, history, uh, a complicated history as well, and one that uh, really um, uh, asks for our deep engagement, right? Otherwise, it's um, otherwise that kind of histories can, can get lost and, and become invisible uh, if, not, if we're not careful. Um, so Henry Clay Frick, in addition to making a huge fortune in steel, uh, assembled a really excellent collection of old master art. Um, this was between 1899 and, and 1919 when he died. So really in the last 20 years of his life, he devoted all of his energies, all of his uh, resources as well, which were considerable to the collecting of, of art. Um, he basically left the steel industry behind him and lived out his days in New York as a sort of um, art collector. Um, the uh, term old masters, you know, we typically use that to refer to Western European art from the Renaissance to the 19th century in this case. Um, so the frick contains paintings and sculptures from that uh, region and time period, as well as decorative arts from, from Asia, from, from around the world, from the Middle East, uh, and, and so forth. Um, so we'll, we'll explore uh, a lot of those treasures today. Frick wrote in his will that the house should become a gallery of art to which the entire public shall forever have access after his death. Uh, so this was kind of the, the reason the museum was, was, was formed, was convened. Frick died in 1919. Um, his wife Adelaide continued living in this house until 1932 when she died. Uh, upon her death, the will was activated, um, the board of trustees uh, convened, uh, a director was appointed, and the museum opened its doors to the public in 1935. Um, so um, the Frick is a relatively new museum, actually, when you think about the landscape of, of museums in New York City. Um, and I think it's it's interesting to consider that fact, because when we get inside, you'll see that the architecture, the design of the building um, is, is trying to seem older than it is, right? It's hearkening to, I think, a kind of um, European neo-Renaissance uh, 17th, 18th century style. Um, so the Frick is, is a wonderful kind of time time capsule or, or a, a way of time traveling in a sense, not just to the Gilded Age in New York City, but even further back in time to, to uh, centuries ago in, in Europe. Um, I also just really love that language in the will um, for, for all of Frick's complications as an individual. I think he got it right on that. Um, a gallery of art to which the entire public shall forever have access. Um, entire public, right? Not just the public. And uh, we might think carefully about what that meant to Frick in 1919 versus what it means today in 2023, entire public. Um, and, and not just shall have access, but shall forever have access. This idea of perpetuity, that as long as these objects um, are extant on the face of the earth, um, the public will and must have access to them. It's kind of a beautiful idea, right? A kind of um, forward-looking, future-looking uh, language, right? So this is a more recent photo of the Frick. Um, as seen from the Fifth Avenue Garden. Um, these are the famous magnolia trees um, in, in full bloom. I think we're just through two, three weeks um, after the fact uh, or removed from this moment in, in the springtime. Uh, but people love these magnolias and, and travel to see them. So getting inside the museum now. Uh, oh, okay. And just briefly before we do that, um, a note to say that um, we're not currently actually at the mansion right now because we're doing some renovation enhancement work on, on the house. Um, so this is actually where the collection is for the time being. And so if you're in New York um, or visiting in the next year, um, do find us here. This is uh, what's called Frick Madison. It's a sort of temporary home while we work on the house. Um, this building used to be the Whitney Museum of, of American Art um, between 1966 and 2009, uh, before reopening at its new building uh, further downtown. Um, it's a wonderful um, uh, building in its own right, kind of masterpiece of brutalist architecture. Um, and as you can see, it's kind of like the opposite type of building imaginable from the Frick Mansion, uh, kind of Gilded Age Mansion. So um, what, what you get in this building is a wonderful study in contrasts. You get to see this 
kind of a very uh, you know, rich um, Gilded Age collection uh, in, in the space of this kind of minimalist, brutalist space. And um, if, as I say, if you're in the city uh, at any point, do check it out. It's, it's kind of a once in a lifetime way to see this collection. So it's just a note about the present. Um, getting now into the house. So here we are inside the building, inside the mansion. And this is a space known as the Garden Court, a very beautiful, very tranquil, um, lovely space to kind of begin a, a, an experience of the collection, kind of a traditional starting point uh, for, for uh, visits to this house. Um, something that not a lot of people know about this Garden Court space, uh, however, is that um, the Frick family never actually saw this. This was all added to the house when the house was converted into a museum in the early 1930s. Um, so you'll see that this wall of windows that runs the length of the garden court, those arched windows, that used to be the exterior wall of the house. So where we're standing now, virtually, uh, used to be a kind of open air courtyard, basically a, a carriageway or a driveway space. Um, I think that as we get into the original house proper, um, you'll notice the sort of shift in materials. Um, as we as we kind of leave this limestone fountain space and move into carpeted wood paneled rooms, uh, rooms that are really all about the display of, of Frick's um, personal collection of art, which is um, uh, mostly what the, the, the museum contains, right? Um, you, you might even note the kind of uh, acoustic change that, that happens. You might imagine kind of leaving this, this uh, kind of echoing reverberant fountain space and then entering the sort of almost sacred hush of the galleries themselves. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the multi-sensory joy of, of, of visiting a house museum like this, right? So we'll, we'll kind of go into the house uh, through the doorway that's just behind these pillars. We can't see them, but uh, we'll, we'll head through there now. And we arrive here, uh, a lovely place to begin uh, in the galleries. This is a room known as the library. And I think you see immediately the sort of, um, you, you feel the kind of atmosphere of this uh, mansion. Um, we can note a few things right away, actually, about the decoration, and I, I think it's quite telling about the rest of the house. So, so this is a, a library, ostensibly, but notice that the bookshelves are pretty low to the ground. They only go up to about this height, up to about you know your your waist height if you're standing here. Um, they stop short of what is at eye level, which, as you look around the room, everywhere you look are paintings. Um, even the ceiling, you'll notice, is is left blank. Uh, bare, undecorated, unfrescoed, unmirrored, ungilded. Um, and this is kind of a strange thing in, in the Gilded Age not to have decoration up there. Um, we know that Henry Clay Frick was insistent that nothing in the display and decoration of the rooms should distract from the collection which hangs at eye level. Um, even the uh, walls you'll see are, are made up of these wall panels, uh, each of which is a space to hang a painting. So it, it's really written in the you know, architectural identity of the house, that it's a house for the display of uh, works of art. Um, so really everywhere you look at eye level in this house, you see a painting or a sculpture or a porcelain object or bronze, uh, some kind of work of, of art. Um, you might also kind of feel like you're in an English country manor, <laughs> which is uh, itself interesting, right? So so this this building, as I say, was 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 built between 1912 and 1915. Um, I find it interesting to think about other American architecture that's at play in 1912 and 1915, there are architects like Frank Lloyd Wright who are at work, right? Architects who are defining a kind of American modernism, right? Um, this is decidedly not that. This is almost emphatically not that, right? Um, I think that uh, Frick and his decorators, his architects were very deliberately trying to recreate the types of rooms and the types of environments that these paintings would have originally occupied uh, across the Atlantic Ocean in Europe, right? So it's it's no accident that you, you might feel like you're in a kind of English country manor or, or a French uh, city palace or a kind of Italian uh, palazzo, right? If you look through these, uh, the doorway there, you see these the, the suite of adjoining rooms, this enfilade view, as it's called, uh, almost down to uh, uh, to infinity, right? Kind of these, these doorways these, and the succession of, of beautiful rooms. Um, this is a very European um, thing to do, I think, in a house. Um, so, so Frick is interested, I think, in... And, it, and basically creating or recreating a, a, a kind of top rate European collection in New York City. Um, so uh, as I say, it's a, a kind of double double uh, time capsule, double time travel in that sense, not just to the Gilded Age, but even further back in time and across the ocean as well. I think it's interesting to think about uh, the time period that Frick is collecting uh, works of art, 1899 to 1919, right? This is, um, 
in in uh and you know this is sort of the war era the great you know great the great war the world war one um but this is also in, in in england specifically this is kind of like the downton abbey era in a sense when you have um a lot of grand aristocratic families who are in decline and, and are actually uh, forced to liquidate forced to sell a lot of their uh treasures uh at auction right so um here come millionaires like henry clay frick at this moment jp morgan Isabella Stewart Gardner in, in Boston and, and, and many more um, who are more than happy to kind of um, use their newish wealth to, to buy up these treasures that are that are suddenly appearing on the art market. So um, Frick is essentially reaching his arm across the Atlantic Ocean, snapping up these treasures, bringing them back to New York City and, and recreating a kind of European collection uh, on, on these shores, right? So you, we might think carefully about the sort of um, identity formation that's at play in, in this practice of collecting, that um, if you choose to uh, build yourself a house that looks a certain way, that contains a certain type of art, um, you're also creating a certain type of personality for yourself, right? And this is something that all of us are doing, I think, in our own homes. Um, maybe we're not buying Gilded Age um, old masters, right? Uh, but but I think that everybody, the way you decorate your bedroom, the, the things you put in your kitchen and so forth, um, all of it is, is, is a means of kind of forming your own self, uh, especially um, when you present it to the public. So uh, we might think about that practice of collecting as we walk through this uh, museum as well. So um, this room contains uh, lots of English paintings, uh, portraits by Thomas Lawrence, by uh, Rayburn, uh, paintings by James W. Turner on either side of the fireplace there, uh, and we'll be coming back to him. Um, and above the fireplace there, you see uh, a portrait of Frick himself, Henry Clay Frick, that's a posthumous portrait, um, just so you know that it look, know what he looks like, <laughs> very kind of stern and imposing uh, businessman. In each of these rooms, I've chosen one or two objects to show you in uh, greater depth. So here I've actually picked the one um, non-English subject in the room. Um, and that's uh, here in the corner. You might have spied him, Gilbert Stewart's portrait of, of George Washington. The, uh, this is sort of a famous and iconic portrait, uh, an image that we, we perhaps know quite well just from our own visual culture. Um, apparently, Stewart, who, who painted this portrait, um, painted many of them. Uh, he he could kind of paint them on request um, to kind of like match the curtains in your living room. He could change the green curtain here to a blue curtain. He could change the red jacket to a black jacket or a blue jacket, whatever it might be. Um, this one we think is the is the second one that Stuart produced. So uh, the closer you get to the original, uh, the more we think it looks like the historical George Washington. So um, this this must this must be what what he looks like. And it's nice to actually get very close to the. Uh, to the portrait itself, we never really uh, do this, and to, to see how beautifully it is painted. Um, there's a lovely uh, kind of liquid quality, I think, to this expression. Uh, moments like the little sheen at the tip of the nose, that little bit of white highlight there. Um, we see something of the, the cleanliness and something of the rosiness, the sort of humanity of this uh, individual, um, this sort of hero, right, of the Revolutionary War. Um, wonderful material details, too, like the way powder seems to be falling from Washington's wig onto his uh, the collar of his coat here, this beautiful maroon uh, velvet uh, coat. Uh, we see these beautiful brass buttons as well. He has a, a linen uh, ruff there uh, coming out at the chest. Uh, all, all very kind of tactile, everything very available uh, to us. I think it's interesting that Frick um, collected uh, some American art, but when he uh, arranges this house, this grand mansion in New York City. He displays um, uh, no American art, <laughs> with the exception of, of Whistler, who's a sort of an expat anyway, who's living mostly in Europe. Um, but interesting, right, that there's a lot of great American painting happening at this time, but the uh, collection and the identity that Frick is putting forward via his uh, house is decidedly a European one. He collects English, Dutch, Spanish, Italian, French pictures, and that's really what you find at the Frick. Um, you could step through the doors and, and and forget that you're in America. And I think that Frick was sort of designing it that way. So continuing into the next space here, we have a very beautiful room known as the Living Hall. And this in many ways is, is uh, the heart of the collection. Um, it's one of the few rooms in the house where the paintings, as you see them on the walls, um, have not changed at all. They're, they haven't moved since the Frick family was living here. And I think it's because um, Henry Clay Frick decided on a very strong uh, hang, a very strong insulation. It's kind of hard for the cur curators to improve on, on what he did here. Um, on either side of the fireplace, you see these two extremely famous portraits by Hans Holbein. On the left, a portrait of Sir Thomas More. 
on the right, a portrait of Sir Thomas Cromwell. Uh, both of these men were um, extremely uh, powerful and influential advisors to Henry VIII, um, advisors to the king. Um, Cromwell was, was essentially responsible for the beheading of Thomas More uh, over the act of supremacy, the Anne Boleyn affair. Um, More uh, was you know, arguing against the king that, that the divorce was, was not allowed on, on theological grounds, and Cromwell said, you know, uh, let's just kill him then. <laughs> um, Cromwell himself, you know, later lost his head for, for a different reason. Um, but there they are, these two with their heads on, kind of staring at each other um, for all eternity. You can kind of sense the electricity across the, the fireplace there. In the center, um, breaking up the fight, is uh, a painting of El Greco's Saint Jerome. He's dressed as a cardinal, uh, pointing to a Bible, which, which Saint Jerome famously translated into Latin for the first time. On the opposite wall, just kind of turning to the right here, uh, we have um, Italian Renaissance pictures, specifically Venetian Renaissance pictures, uh, the half-length portraits at left and right. So uh, these two men uh, are both by Titian, the great Venetian master. And in the center is a painting by Titian's teacher, um, Giovanni Bellini. And, and this is his, uh, a lot of people's favorite work of art in the whole collection. It's certainly one of my top two or three. Um, it's been called the most important painting, uh, most important Italian painting in North America. It's been called one of the two greatest Renaissance pictures in the United States. Um, a lot of superlatives attached to this. The painting is called St. Francis in the Desert. Um, we'll dive into that um, in just a moment, as well as uh, the great Holbein, Thomas More. Uh, but before I do, it's, uh, I just want to uh, pan around again and, and point out that um, these rooms at the Frick Collection are, are kind of wonderful in that they're not arranged strictly by school of painting or by geography or even by chronology. Um, you have a painter like Holbein, who is uh, a German Swiss painter who was working in England, um, hanging alongside El Greco, who was a Greek born painter working in Spain and in Rome. Uh, you have the Venetian painters across the way. Um, you add to this, you know, Italian, French, uh, Italian as a uh, small uh, bronze sculptures from the Renaissance, uh, French Baroque furniture, like this table, like this beautiful bull clock. You have even uh, a Herat rug here from the Persian Empire, from modern day Iran underfoot. You also have porcelain from, from China uh, in the 18th century, the, 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 the bases of these lamps, as well as these, as these vases that are on the mantelpiece, these beautiful Femi Noir vases, as they're called, black ground vases. Um, and if I swing over to the left here, you also see as we look out toward the Fifth Avenue Garden, and here the light comes in, uh, these beautiful uh, porcelain figurines, again, mounted atop these uh, French Baroque uh, commodes. Um, these are what are known as Kangxi figurines made in the 18th century in China for export to France. So when you think about it, um, this is kind of a wonderful uh, mishmash of, of things, right? It's kind of a, an eclectic uh, arrangement of objects, actually. And um, I think this is one of the distinct pleasures of house museums specifically is that um, uh, you, you're looking at the vision of one collector, a uh, kind of strange and utopic vision of what a room filled with art can look like. Um, and especially when you look at somebody like Henry Clay Frick, who had kind of unlimited resources, uh, what you get is this kind of um, uh, totally fantastical, whimsical um, uh, time capsule again of, of, of artistry and, and collecting in, in the beginning of the 20th century. So I'll dive here into this wonderful portrait by uh, Holbein of Thomas More. This is made around uh, 1527, right when uh, Holbein arrives in England. And he, as soon as he arrives, he's kind of hell-bent on becoming court painter to the king. Um, so he executes this portrait um, of Thomas More, the great uh, intellectual theologian. He's a saint in, in the Catholic church. Uh, author of, of Utopia, uh, Man for All Seasons, right? Um, uh, a friend of uh, Erasmus as well, who, who was a friend of, 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 uh, of Holbein's. So uh, that's how he made the introduction. And that's how he got into the court, basically. And so Holbein executes this portrait as a sort of proof of his skill. And as you might be able to tell, it, it worked. <laughs> um, I think this is about as good as it gets in terms of uh, illusionistic um, uh, Renaissance portraiture. It's an extraordinary painting. I think that nobody alive can really do this anymore. It's kind of interesting to think about certain skills that 
are really passed down via masters and apprentices and uh, the way that certain skills can kind of vanish from the face of the earth if, if we're not uh, careful to kind of preserve them. Um, but an extraordinary portrait, um, the material details again are just so sumptuous and, and so uh, visually rewarding, be it um, velvet, like this gorgeous red velvet sleeve um, that, that Holbein shows us not only here on Thomas More's right hand, but on Thomas More's left uh, wrist as well, where the, the velvet is uh, foreshortened or extended backward into the space of the picture. Um, so hard to do that if you paint or if you draw. Um, foreshortening is, is one of the trickiest things to, to kind of master, um, let alone to do it in, in red crushed velvet. And it was a beautiful black shadowed velvet. It's um, a big flex basically from Holbein uh, that, that he's capable of doing all this. We see the way he's painting fur as well. Every single bristle and strand of the fur is visible. Uh, even details like here where the fur turns over the shoulder and you can see through the fur kind of into the depths of it and to the black uh, uh, kind of the roots there. Um, we also have this massive gold chain that Thomas More wears around his shoulders. Um, you see that the pendant of this chain is the, the Tudor rose, the, the symbol of, of uh, Henry VIII's family. This uh, gold chain is almost certainly a gift of favor from the king. Um, the S's of the chain links might stand for a French motto, uh, souvent me souviens, um, th remember me often, think of me often. Um, and we know actually that when Thomas More was imprisoned in the Tower of London, um, awaiting his um, execution, he refused to take this chain off. Actually, he was he was quite proud of it. And, and so it's, I think, significant and, and telling that it's in the portrait of him as well. And when we get to the face here, I mean, this largely speaks for itself, um, this extraordinary capture of this individual, almost photographic um, capture, almost better than a photograph, I think. Um, you get details like this, you know, five o'clock shadow coming up, right? We get a sense for the time of day when this might have been painted. Um, you see the bags beneath his eyes. You can almost tell how much sleep he got last night. Um, we have a real sense of an individual who's um, a kind of fierce intellectual, um, busy, it seems, um, kind of maybe impatient perhaps for this port portrait sitting to be uh, done with, right? Um, but an amazing uh, just, just capture of this individual. Uh, as I say, I think this is about as good as it gets in terms of uh, Renaissance portraiture. You often see this portrait reproduced in, in art history textbooks. Um, it's, it's, it's definitive. Right? So to, to turn around now and, and to look across the way at the great Bellini, uh, St. Francis, here it is, uh, with with thanks to the Google Arts and Culture Project, um, which has created this wonderful ultra megapixel, um, super high res uh, image of the, of the painting. Um, what we see here is, is um, Bellini painting it around 1475 in Venice. Um, St. Francis of Assisi in the wilderness. He's here, uh, he seems to have made a kind of makeshift uh, shelter out of this cave. And you see within the shelter that he has kind of all the implements he needs for a life of, of holiness and devotion, uh, a Bible sitting on top of a prayer desk. There's a skull there to kind of contemplate the, the death of Christ, the passion of Christ. Um, we see that he has uh, a bench that kind of is, is, is built into the fence here to kind of sit at the prayer desk. Um, he's got a pair of sandals, a walking stick. There's even a kind of um, inner fence protecting the inner sanctum of the cave. This looks to be woven from willow branches. Um, and there's a crucifix here all the way on the right with a crown of thorns. Um, and if you follow this little yellow string actually all the way up, you see that there's a little knot there, a kind of handhold. Um, it loops over this branch and we can trace it all the way into the depths of the cave into the shadows where we see that there's a, a prayer bell that Francis has, has built into the the cave itself. Um, it's, he's actually fitted it into uh, two of the branches of this uh, beautiful grapevine, which is flourishing at the top of the cave. Um, so Francis actually has all of the uh, accoutrements, right? He has all the things that he needs to live a life of holy devotion here. But I think it's significant that in the moment we find him in this painting, he has literally turned his back on all of that, right? He's taken off his sandals, he's left his walking stick, and he's um, sort of walked away from that enclosure. And what he's doing is he's stepping forward into the foreground um, and looking into the heavens at something that we cannot quite see, but he clearly seems to be in a state of spiritual ecstasy, right? His, um, his arms are outstretched. He's stepping forward very lightly on the ground in front of him. Um, he's bending backward 
at the hip, right? His spine is kind of tilted backward. And we see that his eyes are almost um, rolling back into his skull. His jaw has, has dropped uh, almost involuntarily, right? Um, he seems to be experiencing something quite, quite profound, right? Um, we might wonder what it is that he's seeing. Um, before we do, though, we, we, we might just kind of revel at the, the plenitude of, of natural details that are available to us, these beautiful plants and flowers, uh, animals which start appearing the longer that you spend with this painting, a little rabbit here beneath the hand of Francis that pokes its head out from the wall, um, or here on the far left, you might notice that there's a little water spout that kind of perhaps directs water from the stream in the distance to, the, to Francis's uh, abode in the foreground. Beneath that water spout, there's a little bird, a kingfisher drinking from that water. A beautiful, another beautiful detail. Lots of little rewards for close attention. In the middle ground, we see more animals. We see uh, a donkey, um, which has a, a very beautiful inner life almost. I think it's painted with great care. We might see that donkey and think of moments in, in, the, in the gospels uh, involving donkeys, like the, the flight into Egypt, uh, the Holy, Holy Family riding a donkey, um, or uh, Jesus's entry into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey, right? Um, you can read this painting almost like a kind of uh, text and, and your mind will light up with various biblical allusions. Uh, there's a gray heron here. And in the distance, we have a flock of sheep and a shepherd, right? So Francis is not the only human figure in this scene. Um, the shepherd is also significant, right? In, in, uh, in Exodus, you might think of Moses leading his people through the desert, or uh, again, of Christ, who is a sort of descendant of, of Moses in a sense, right? Leading his, his own people, or you might think of the Lamb of God, right? Um, the shepherd, very curiously, um, is looking up from his work toward the foreground, um, toward us, right? Um, as though something has happened that has caught his attention, right? So the mystery kind of uh, deepens, right? And, and I'll add to this mystery the, the fact that almost nothing in this painting casts a shadow except for the saint, right? And it's a very definite shadow. Uh, where the donkey is standing, it seems to be high noon, right? There are these little puddles of shadow beneath its hooves, but Francis receives this very intense, very definite shadow below. So perhaps we're looking at, at multiple light sources, perhaps we're looking at supernatural light sources in a sense. And um, this is one of the wonders of, of Zoom is being able to go into the very upper reaches of paintings like this. You normally can't do this, like floating in the air in the galleries and getting right up close to it. But if you go into the upper left-hand corner of this painting, into this beautiful uh, ultramarine sky, uh, we see these uh, very lovely golden clouds that, that Bellini has, has arranged here against the sky. And we see that dragging through those clouds are these very definite diagonal rays of light, these golden rays of light, which seem to pass through the clouds. They seem to almost enter this tree, actually, which is much closer to us. But the tree itself seems to sort of bend backward and react to the force of that, of that light, of those golden rays of light. If you extend this line, this diagonal line, all the way through the tree and all the way into the kind of depths of the painting, you realize that it takes you almost exactly to the gaze of Francis below. It's almost geometrical precision, right? So I, th I think that the painter is indeed implying that something strange, something divine, something supernatural is happening in the sky. And it has to do with Francis's reception of that vision uh, through, his, through his eyes, through his sight. So many scholars think that this is the moment that Francis receives the stigmata, the wounds of Christ in his palms, in his feet, and the fifth wound uh, in his side. And looking very closely at his hands here, you do see that he has these uh, definite marks of red paint uh, right in the center of each palm. Um, so perhaps this is the moment that he receives that, that miracle, that, that uh, mark of, of devotion that's uh, really reserved for only the very holiest of, of Christian followers. We might wonder about the foot, where we don't quite see the same uh, red dot but we do have this very distinct um, dark notch atop the foot. And this painting went to the Metropolitan Museum in 2010 for uh, analysis. And this is one of the little uh, areas where they focused, actually. The conservators of the Met actually took a microscopic sample of that dark notch, analyzed it, and determined that it used to contain red paint. And in fact, it's the same red pigment that was used for the dots on the palms. So what we think has happened here 
uh, is, is that over the course of centuries, over the course of five centuries, um, visitors have stood in front of this painting so in awe of it and, and felt so in the presence of, of the saint that they reached out and, and touched the foot in reverence, right? Um, and each time they, they took a little bit of that, of that red paint, a little bit of that blood with them. Um, kind of an amazing notion because um, almost every other square inch of the painting is in pristine condition. It, it looks perfectly preserved. Um, it, it speaks, I think, to the kind of reverence that, that objects like this, great works of art like this, induce in, in, in viewers, the kind of um, holy reverence that, that they uh, uh, kind of, they elicit a sort of care, I think, from people across the centuries that anybody who encounters this object thinks, my gosh, this is incredible. We have to take care of this. We have to preserve it. And when you see it in person in the galleries, it, it does look uh, incredibly fresh and luminous. It looks like it was painted just uh, last week. Um, it has a kind of incredible power uh, physically over you. Um, so this is one of those paintings that you can really return to over the course of uh, a whole lifetime, really. So um, if you're ever, uh, you know, at the Frick, um, save some extra time for this one, and and uh, you won't you won't be disappointed. This this spot on the rug uh, in front of the painting is is routinely worn threadbare from the the, the shoes of of thousands of people who who stand here in a kind of reverie before this painting. So um, join in that tradition next time you're at the Frick too. It's you won't be disappointed. So continuing now, uh, we'll, we'll head through the next doorway into uh, a room called the Fragonard Room here. And here we have effectively a kind of period room, an 18th century French period room. Um, this is um, another of the rooms where the paintings have not really moved because they are actually built into the walls. These are canvases that are uh, uh, kind of built into the room. Uh, the room was sort of refitted to accommodate these paintings after Henry Clay Frick acquired them. Um, it's called the Fragonard Room because the paintings are made by Fragonard, uh, Jean-Honoré Fragonard, the great 18th century French uh, Rococo painter. These are often considered his, his masterpiece. Uh, it's a, a series of paintings known as the Progress of Love, um, a series of panels that depict uh, various moments in the courtship of a, of a young couple. Um, I'll show you uh, the individual scenes in, in just a moment. Following suit from the, the paintings, the room is filled with 18th century French objects as well. Uh, so more um, Rococo furniture, tapestry chairs from the French royal court, uh, porcelain from the Royal Sevres porcelain manufactory there on the center table, um, small sculptures, uh, uh, decorative arts. That's a clock on the mantelpiece that I'll show you. Um, and here's another excellent little terracotta sculpture on this commode on the far right. Um, a sculpture of Zephyrus and Flora, often overlooked actually because of the paintings are so uh, mesmerizing. Um, but I'll show you that that sculpture. Here it is, um, a wonderful uh, example of, of terracotta sculpture. This is by Clodion, uh, the great 18th century French sculptor. We see here a scene from, <clears throat> from Ovid's Metamorphoses, in which uh, the god Zephyrus, the god of the west wind, we can identify him because he has these uh, dragonfly wings. Um, he's crowning a nymph called Chloris, uh, Flora. She's becoming Flora, the goddess of flowers, the goddess of spring. He's placing a garland of roses atop her head. Um, they seem to be floating in the air. We see Zephyrus's uh, drapery there kind of flying around him. Uh, and there are a few uh, putti or little cupids here that are um, supporting actors. Um, uh, kind of pushing uh, Flora's leg uh, upward, um, making everything even more airborne and kind of levitating. We see the skill of the sculptor here in, in rendering these anatomies with such um, lightness, right? The, the way that um, uh, uh, Flora's heel here is lifted from the surface, the, the way that her right foot is entirely floating in space. We see the shadow beneath it. Um, even even Zephyrus's foot is raised from the surface, from the, the, the pedestal there. Um, to imagine doing this in terracotta, in clay, and then putting it in the kiln and like crossing your fingers and hoping nothing uh, explodes or flies off. It's, it's kind of amazing. You wonder how many versions of this there were before this one. Um, the anatomies themselves are also gorgeously rendered. This is sort of the, the French uh, academy <clears throat> at its best. And we have here this moment of the embrace where um, one of the delights of seeing this in person is noticing that the chins of the two figures are touching, their noses are touching, but their lips are slightly apart. So it's almost like seeing the exact moment 
that the transformation occurs, uh, this metamorphosis, as, as Ovid puts it in his myth. Clodion also sculpted the base of this clock that sits on the mantelpiece. What we have here are three nymphs <clears throat> who, are, who are dancing in a circle uh, beneath the mechanism of the clock. Uh, again, a kind of wonderful lightness and sense of dynamism and movement in the drapery and the way that their legs are, are dangling in free space. They <clears throat> are often identified as the hours, the ori, uh, because they make the time pass uh, through this mechanism above. This is what's called an annular dial. Uh, it rotates like, like the earth. And the way that you read this is, is that this arrow actually points to the correct time. Um, so the Roman numeral below gives you the hour. The Arabic numeral gives you the, <clears throat> the minute. So this would say 10.52 or so. And this clock, the clock does still keep very good time 250 odd years later. Uh, so you can imagine it kind of ticking and, and chiming as you walk through the galleries as well. So to show you some of the, the paintings, and, and perhaps you looked at, at these briefly uh, with, with, with Olivia Brooklyn, um, but just to kind of revisit them, um, this is, I say, is a series of paintings that, that tells a kind of sequential narrative uh, of the progress of love. Uh, this is uh, often considered the first of the four scenes. It's known as the pursuit. And here we find the kind of the key players in this drama, uh, a young man on the left who appears holding out a rose to the young lady on the right who's standing up. Um, the offering of a rose is sort of the traditional gesture of love in the French court. Not much has changed, I think, in the, into the 21st century. We see that she is very uh, astounded by his appearance and kind of shocked, maybe he's a little scandalized. Um, but we can also notice that she's looking very carefully at the rose and maybe she's starting to kind of wonder about a future with this guy, right? Maybe, maybe this could work, right, used to say. In each of these um, paintings, there's an upper half where we find a sculpture group that's kind of um, commenting on what's happening below. So in this case, the sculpture group uh, is a pair of cupids, a pair of putti, um, and they're restraining a dolphin. The dolphin seems to be the source of the water for this fountain, right, that, that empties below them. Uh, but the dolphin is significant because it's synonymous usually in Greek myth with uh, Venus or Aphrodite, the goddess of love. And so um, if these dolphins are restraining, or sorry, if these cupids are restraining the dolphin, uh, we might read that as saying, okay, so they seem to know that love is in the vicinity. They, they sense the presence of love, um, but they're urging patience. They're urging caution, right? They're saying, hold your horses, hold your dolphins, almost literally, right? Um, and they seem to be speaking to the young man below. They seem to be looking in his direction, right? Urging him uh, to, to wait just a moment, right? So that's the pursuit. The next painting in the series is called The Meeting. And here, uh, once more, we find a young man and a young woman. He seems to be uh, you know, hopping over a wall. He's climbed up the ladder. Um, he seems to be meeting with her in secret. She's holding out a hand saying, wait, 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 go back down, <laughs> right? Somebody's coming. Somebody might discover them. Um, and we see that in her other hand, in the shadows here, uh, she's holding a little piece of paper, right? This is probably the the note by which they arranged their this little rendezvous, right? Uh, a note that bears a, a red wax seal there, uh, which is also quite significant. Um, above them, in this case, the sculpture group is uh, the goddess of love herself, Venus, holding Cupid's arrows uh, away from him, right? So, so Cupid now, I think, is is really eager to to get one of his arrows and to kind of make this love affair happen. Uh, but but Venus, once more, is is urging patience. She's saying, no, you can't have your arrows now, right? Now is not yet the time. And I think she seems to be reading the situation. I think that's very clever the way that both the women, uh, the young lady and, and the goddess of love are both looking off to the left, off stage, and, and saying, wait, wait a second, right? So that's the meeting. The third picture in the series is called The Lover Crowned. And here finally is the, the kind of um, the apotheosis of this love. It's almost like a, a wedding scene. The love has finally happened. Um, she seems to be crowning the young man with a, a garland of roses, kind of like Zephyrus and Flora uh, in the sculpture that we saw. There's even a third figure in the scene, an artist who is sketching them. He's kind of commemorating this moment, capturing it, right? Um, 
kind of like a like a wedding photographer, I suppose, in the 18th century, right? He's he's preserving it for for posterity. Uh, everything is in full bloom around them. It's the heights the height of spring. Um, there's even this very beautiful potted orange tree off to the right, with this kind of symphony of, of green tones used to pick out all the light and shade within the tree. Um, just gorgeous, gorgeous painting and technique. Fragonard, we know now, is, is one of the, the great uh, draftsmen in, in history of Western art. Um, and oftentimes, I think, if, if you're not so into the Rococo, you think of Fragonard as very uh, florid and kind of pink and a little much. But to look at this beautiful orange tree is to see just how sophisticated he was as a sort of colorist and as a painter, um, this uh, wonderful palette of, 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 of depths of green. Um, in this case, the, the sculpture is Cupid, again, our old friend. Uh, but he's sleeping, right? His arrows are lying next to him, uh, unneeded, because now that the love has happened, now that he's done his work, he has nothing left to do, uh, so he takes a nap, right? <laughs> Wonderful. And the last painting in the series, the fourth one, is called Love Letters. And here we find uh, this couple. Um, they seem to be happily married. They seem to be looking through this pile of letters to her right, also bearing red wax seals, right? So perhaps they're reliving their uh, their 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 courtship. They're reliving their love notes that they wrote to each other. And maybe that's why they're blushing a little bit, right? You can kind of see them, uh, and he's looking very lovingly at her as though uh, as though they're on their first date or something, right? Uh, they're they're pictured with um, a dog who stares directly at us. The dog symbolizes uh, fidelity and, and loyalty. Perhaps these two are also loyal and faithful to each other. And in this case, the sculpture above is a different figure, a different goddess, um, uh, not Aphrodite. She's she's clothed and she has a kind of different hairstyle. So um, she's usually identified actually as the goddess of friendship, uh, amitié, loving friendship. Uh, she's holding a heart at her breast uh, Cupid is there below trying to jump up and maybe grab the heart, uh, but perhaps the message here is that um, the, the love and the friendship are now inextricable, that this love has now turned into something more than just a kind of um, uh, erotic affair, that, that there's a deeper kind of companionship, a, a deeper kind of uh, friendship that's formed between these two, that these, are, these two are loyal to each other, that uh, try as Cupid might to uh, grab the heart and cause mischief and maybe get these two to wander away from each other, um, they will refuse because they are true. They're true to each other. They're, they're sort of uh, happily married, right? Um, so uh, Amitié, uh, the goddess of friendship, is, is just, I think, very impervious to Cupid. They're sort of shooing him away and you're not welcome here. <laughs> um, but I, I think you can imagine why, why people so love um, the Fragonard Room. Um, for a lot of people, it's their favorite room, not just in the house, but in, in all of New York City. Um, it's this wonderful um, way of transporting yourself to the 18th century uh, French court, this this kind of very uh, flowery, very fragrant world where, where love is always uh, present, where love never dies, where it's always summer, right? Um, Alternately, some people see these paintings and say, you know, you can you can feel the, the revolution coming. <laughs> and I think that's equally true, um, that it would just be another decade or so before all of this came crashing down, before all the guillotines came crashing down. Uh, but here it is, um, the Rococo French art kind of preserved uh, in on Fifth Avenue of all places in New York City. So continuing now into the next space, um, we move basically from 18th century France to 18th century England, and we have the dining room. This very beautiful, um, tranquil, uh, green space. And we might notice a few kind of strange things about the dining room right away. Uh, one being that, you know, for a house that's this huge, that's a pretty small dining table, right? And this is the original dining table. Um, if you look beneath the surface there, you see that the table has many legs and there's a, a line that subdivides the table. So this uh, table can be opened outward, right? So additional leaves can be brought in uh, and expanded. Uh, the table can be expanded to accommodate, I think 24, 25 guests. Um, but I find it very telling that this is the, the default arrangement, right? I think that what it does is that it, it, um, it doesn't overstep the paintings, right? So some dining rooms you walk into, uh, the table is really the dominant feature of the room, high back chairs, maybe the table is laid for dinner, crystalware, silver, etc. Um, here, a very kind of minimal arrangement, actually. And uh, the effect, I think, is that visitors to this room 
can have the joy and the freedom of, of walking around the space uh, as though you were at a museum, right? Taking in these paintings from different angles, different perspectives, different distances. Um, all throughout, I think Frick is thinking about the, the future life of, of this house as a sort of museum, right? For where, where members of the public can enjoy the works of art. Um, the other strange thing about this house is that, or about this room, the dining room, is that the paintings on the walls are English Grand Manor aristocratic portraits. This is strange because normally when you go to somebody's house for dinner uh, and look at the pictures of people on the walls, you tend to assume that those are family members, um, ancestors, uh, aunts and uncles and, and grandparents and so forth. Um, Henry Clay Frick was 0% related to any of these people. <laughs> um, but I think that in choosing to a, a range dining room that has portraiture like this, what he's doing is he's effectively linking himself to the English aristocracy, right? He's using this uh, visual tradition of, of power in England, in the West, in Western Europe, and deploying it to his own purposes in, in this room on Fifth Avenue, where he would have been entertaining uh, JP Morgan and friends, other elites in New York, other bankers, elected officials, and so forth. So again, um, we might think about the, the type of identity formation that's created by collecting, right? That this is uh, Frick um, creating a version of himself um, in, in this uh, most public facing room, this dining room where he would have entertained guests with 10 course meals and so forth. You might think about the, uh, the Titanic actually, where um, uh, Henry Clay Frick and his wife actually had tickets to, 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 to board the Titanic, but they had to, uh, they had to give them up because I think that uh, Adelaide was uh, had some kind of illness. Um, so their lives were kind of spared in a, in a funny way, I suppose. But uh, that's exactly the era we're talking about here, that kind of um, uh, riding first class in the Titanic um, with Kate Winslet and so forth, right? So um, these are excellent portraits. Um, they're mostly paintings by Thomas Gainsborough, uh, Josh, by, by, by Romney, by Dr. Joshua Reynolds as well. Uh, my favorite of these is this one on the wall here, the, the lady in the blue dress, uh, who's called uh, the Honorable Frances Duncombe. Here's the detail of it. This is made around 1777 in England. Um, I think you see immediately what, what made Thomas Gainsborough so sought after as a portraitist in English society, um, the way that he almost superhumanizes this, this young woman. Uh, he makes her seem sort of divine, the way that she emits light. Um, she glows with an almost kind of ghostly <laughs> pallor, I think, right? And we, and we see perhaps something of the, the fashion of the 1770s in England in, in powdering the skin to make it appear almost supernaturally pale in this way. Even her hair is powdered, right? So that it has this kind of grayish uh, uh, tint to it, right? We see how beautifully Gainsborough is also painting the dress that she wears, this, this gorgeous blue satin uh, dress with a raised lace collar, um, with a ruby there at the, at, the, at the bodice and pearls dangling from the bodice, pearls basically everywhere um, along the hem of this, these slashed sleeves, um, pearls lining the hat that she's holding in her hand. She's even got a string of pearls in her other hand. Uh, pearls line the hem of the dress. Even the white satin underdress is hemmed with pearls in this kind of zigzag pattern. Um, even her shoe has a little pearl or a big pearl kind of dangling from it, right, with the shadow beneath the pearl there. Um, so really driving that, that point home, right? You can't really miss the pearls when you're looking at this portrait. Um, uh, the pose, I think, is also very beautifully choreographed, right? The way that this woman is standing, uh, her arms are crossed, each of her hands is engaged in doing something, holding the hat or showing you the, the quality of the silk fabric. Um, she's stepping forward, right? That foot is very clearly shown to us. Um, she's looking off to her right. Her eyebrow is slightly raised. Her lips are slightly parted as though she's mid-speech. Uh, it's a wonderful kind of hyper-articulate gaze where um, it, it leads the eye in several directions. And it, it, it all adds up to, I think, uh, a, a very kind of vivacious uh, presence, somebody who is on the move, somebody who is um, kind of uh, in conversation with other people, who's, who's full of sort of life, right? We know that she lived a very interesting life. Um, we see her here probably at the age of 20. Um, two years before this, she was betrothed to the future Earl of Radnor, uh, so the son of the Earl of Radnor. Um, so this is a very important um, marriage. It, it, it basically guarantees her uh, inclusion in the in the English aristocracy. In kind of a, a funny arrangement, she and her mother move into the Radnor family home during the engagement, um, and everything is going great for a while uh, until one night uh, the whole family is is out to dinner in Grosvenor Square in London, 
and her fiance's father, the Earl of Radnor, intercepts a letter that's addressed to her. The letter is from a Mr. Arabin, and they've never heard of a Mr. Arabin. Uh, he reads the letter, discovers that she's having an affair with her betrothed. Um, the story goes that he hands a letter to her at dinner <laughs> and says to her, uh, Miss Duncan, what is the meaning of this? What have, what have I or my son never done to you that you should treat us in this manner, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she faints on the spot, uh, maybe conveniently. <laughs> um, the, uh, she's, she's turned out of the Radnor home and the engagement is broken off. So it's this huge scandal, actually, uh, in 1775 uh, London, right? And you return to this portrait, and you have to wonder whether Gainsborough, the painter, was gently making some mention of that scandal, right? This is sort of the major event in her life in the past few years. And so when this, it comes time to paint this portrait, you have to wonder whether he's kind of including that in some way. And I always wonder if he's doing it via the background, this kind of strange... Uh, turbulent uh, background, which, you know, the longer you spend looking at it, the, the weirder it becomes, the fact that the sun is setting in the distance, the fact that there are these purplish clouds gathering overhead, it looks like it might start raining at any moment, right, it looks like it's about to be dark, you kind of worry about her shoes on this dirt path, if it starts raining, you worry about her incredible Marie Antoinette hairstyle, right, if it starts raining, um, all of it creates, a, I think, a sense of kind of turbulence and, and harshness, perhaps, around the figure, Who's all alone out here in, 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 in the open air, right? All of that said, um, you look at her face and, and you see nothing but a kind of supreme command. And, and it's true that, that she recovered from that scandal really beautifully. <laughs> she uh, traveled throughout Europe. Um, she dated Archduke Maximilian Francis for a while in Germany. Uh, when the revolution broke out, she went back to England and, and kind of retired in style in her country seat in Leicestershire and had concerts of Beethoven's music and introduced the music of Beethoven to, to England, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she lived out her days very happily, I think, and eventually married a, another guy, uh, someone called John Bowater of Woolrich. And this might have been, uh, this portrait might have been made on the occasion of that eventual marriage. But I think it's a wonderful capture of this young woman who um, certainly had her own ideas about betrothal in the 18th century, right? And acted very powerfully, I think, of her own uh, agency, her own volition, as opposed to, to that of others. And we believe it, I think, looking at this portrait, that she's the type of person that would walk into any ballroom, into any dining room, and sort of captivate everybody there and, and, uh, and, and walk away from the party with whomever she pleased. Perhaps that's what we're seeing her doing here uh, in, in the space of this portrait, kind of stepping away from the festivities, uh, perhaps meeting with someone in secret. Right? Good. So, so we'll turn around now and we'll start kind of proceeding um, north through the house. Uh, so here we are in a room called uh, the South Hall. This is the dining room off to the right where we just were. Uh, if I pan to the left here, you see a view up what's called the Grand Staircase. Uh, and this is something of the, the grandeur of this, of this mansion, right? This um, very sumptuously decorated um, interior where you see imported colored marbles of, of all variety, um, this massive staircase that leads up to uh, an organ that's built into the house. The idea being that the Fricks employed uh, an organist who had chambers on the third floor and could provide music as needed during uh, dinners, during kind of functions and so forth. Um, I think we're all familiar with that lifestyle, right? Um, here behind us, before we head up the stairs, just really briefly, um, I want to point out uh, one important painting here. Uh, I think you might have looked at this with Olivia Birkland as well. Um, on this wall, you find three 17th century Dutch paintings. Um, the painting in the center is by Habema, the, the Dutch landscapist, and the paintings at left and right are both by Jan Vermeer, Johannes Vermeer. Um, the Frick is home to three paintings by Vermeer, um, there are, I think, 36 or 37 known Vermeers in the world. Um, most of them right now are actually in Amsterdam at, at a massive Vermeer exhibition that they're holding there, including our Vermeer. So um, this is the only way to see them right now, uh, virtually, if you're in New York or in, in the States. Um, this is my favorite of our three. Uh, Vermeer's painting of an officer and a laughing woman, made around 1657. Uh, a gorgeous, gorgeous painting. Um, 
uh, I think very typical actually of what Vermeer was doing throughout his, his painting career, which is to say painting just one or two people in a small room next to a window. And it seems simple on its surface, right? But somehow he's able to reiterate this scene, changing certain elements, uh, changing the light, and he's able to kind of unearth an entire universe, I think, of, of, of feeling and experience and expression uh, in this kind of upper middle class uh, Dutch 17th century life. Uh, we see here a young woman um, and a man uh, who are deeply engaged in some kind of conversation. It's a real joy to be able to get uh, this close to these paintings via Zoom, actually, right? Uh, and to see some of the choices that Vermeer is making with his brush. Uh, up close, I think you can see the way that uh, form for Vermeer is really a function of color, specifically of primary colors. And you see those three primary colors really in conversation all throughout uh, this painting, red, blue, and yellow. We see that her cheeks are blushing very red, right? She has these brightly uh, rouged uh, lips as well. We see that the white cotton uh, bonnet that she wears around her head is actually a very subtly yellow, kind of a buttery yellow uh, bonnet as well. And all the shadows are, are tinged very definitely with, with blue, right? Moving a little further down, we see that um, she's wearing, again, this, this brilliant gold uh, dress. She's holding a glass of wine at the table there. The glass is curiously blue. Her hands are curiously red, right? Um, and the skirt of her dress is also uh, a brilliant kind of blue below. Zooming out, we see the primary colors, I, I think, again, even even more definitely, right? The, the, the red of this man's Dutch military officer's uniform um, uh, next to the yellow of her dress and, and rounding out this trio would be the blue of the map above them, right? So you have all three primary colors there uh, in, in, in short order. The map is complicated. It's hard to read uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, blue, which normally signifies water in a map, is actually here the land. Uh, you can actually see little boats here bobbing in the brown of the harbor. And the other reason is that north, which normally is up, is actually off to the right here. So if you if you tilt your head to the right and um, reverse the colors, uh, what you get is a map of the Dutch Republic of, of Holland, uh, uh, of the Netherlands, right, the modern day Netherlands. Um, so I think suddenly, um, if that's a map of the Netherlands above, this becomes a very Dutch picture, <laughs> hyper Dutch picture. If this man is wearing a Dutch military uh, uniform, and there's a map of Holland above. Um, I, I sometimes imagine, like, what if that were a map of the United States above them, and and uh, a Marine in you know kind of dress uniform below, right? Um, maybe that's approaching what a, a Dutch viewer might have felt looking at this painting. Who's to say? Um, most of all, though, what I think has has most captivated people about Vermeer's painting um, is his handling of of light, the way that that light becomes an almost uh, material substance beneath his brush, the way that it enters through this open window uh, very beautifully, passing through these panes of glass, right? Um, it illuminates the face of this young woman, leaves the man in a very kind of ominous uh, shadow, right? And it travels across the wall behind them in this uh, kind of maddeningly beautiful way, right? Um, you get the sense that these two are, are, are passing the entire um, afternoon wrapped up in conversation with each other, right? That they're losing track of time. They're, they're so engrossed uh, with each other, right? We'll never know what they're saying uh, is kind of the beauty of these pictures too. I think that Vermeer's paintings uh, involve the viewer in this way that the viewer is, is invited into the room um, and asked to kind of complete the picture with, with our imagination in a sense. Are these two lovers? Are they lovers who have been separated by the war? And now he's visiting home for the first time. He's brought her this wine from abroad. Maybe he's telling her about his travels across this map, right? Are they siblings, you know? Um, is, is, is he back in the house for the first time? Are they, who's to say, right? We, we won't quite know. Um, but I think the, the joy of it is, is in that kind of uncertainty, that kind of mystery that uh, this painting will always seem different depending who you're looking at it with, depending on who you are the next time you go and see it again. Right? So we'll we'll turn around um, and go briefly up the stairs. Uh, this is something that you you couldn't do at the house um, because normally there's a, a rope across the landing that forbids access to the second floor. But um, one of the nice features of the architectural uh, en enhancement plan is actually that we're we're opening the second floor to the public. 
uh, for the first time. So uh, all viewers, all visitors will be able to experience this. Um, we're also adding a coffee shop on the second floor for the first time. I know it's kind of a revolutionary idea to put a coffee shop in a museum, uh, but we're, we're going to try it out. Um, so, so lots to look forward to in terms of visitor experience when we're back in the house. This is um, the console of the organ, uh, which is connected to these pipes behind this ornamental uh, grill work there. Um, and so there you, you again, you, you feel something of the, of the kind of state of the artness of this house. It's actually, um, for all that it seems very old fashioned and, and kind of harkens back to 18th century Europe, it's also a hyper modern house. It's electrified, it's climate controlled. There's a sort of early air conditioning system built in here. There's an elevator, a private elevator built in as well. Um, so all, all the kind of amenities you can imagine. If we go up to this uh, vantage point where this little ghostly figure is standing, we arrive here. Not a bad way to walk up to your bedroom after dinner. Right? Uh, and if we get to this vantage point here, we arrive here. And this is now on the second floor uh, in what used to be the private living quarters of the house. You'll notice that the ceiling is a lot lower here, right? These aren't uh, gallery height floors. There are rooms that are really more conducive to uh, actual life, uh, bedrooms, guest bedrooms, breakfast room, uh, th that type of thing. When we're back here, uh, open to the public, these rooms will be galleries, uh, a way for us to show more of the collection, which normally uh, sits in storage um, in, in the basement, in the vaults that are that are in, in the museum's basement. So uh, we look forward to having more uh, on display here in 2024. Great. Okay, so we'll head back down now. And what we'll do is we'll proceed to the final space um, in the house. What we'll, what we'll do basically is walk um, the entire length of the house um, through that doorway, all the way toward that painting in the far distance. So we proceed into this space, the corridor, and then finally turning the corner, we arrive here in a very magnificent room known as the West Gallery. And this is kind of the, uh, the whole point of having a house built from scratch for Henry Clay Frick was to have a room like this, effectively a museum within the home. Uh, a lot of people, when they turn the corner and see this room, they think, oh, this must have been the ballroom, the banquet room, right? Um, that was never the case, though. Notice that there are no windows in this room. There's only the, the light that comes in through this beautiful skylight above, but um, the wall space is reserved for paintings, and it's also uh, windows are, are forbidden because the too much sunlight would, would damage the, the works part as well. So. It's really designed uh, to be what it, what it still is now, a picture gallery. Um, here you find a lot of the great treasures of the collection, uh, paintings by Rembrandt and Goya and Velasquez and Franz Halls and Veronese and Turner. It's kind of a who's who of, of Western art history. Um, I've picked uh, three paintings to show you in, in great depth here, um, just as a sort of sampling of, of what is here. The first being the great Turner Harbor of Dieppe on the wall there. The second being the great Veronese uh, allegory of virtue and vice there. And then the third and final picture that perhaps we'll look at in depth today is the great Rembrandt self-portrait of 1658 here, a kind of nice finale, right? So we can begin with the, the Turner. This is a harborscape that James W. Turner uh, of England painted in around 1824. He showed it at the Royal Academy in 1825. And when he showed it, um, he was roundly criticized for it. He was kind of laughed out the room for it. Um, and and the, the nature of the criticism was, was this. People were saying, Turner is ostensibly painting the harbor of Dieppe in the north of France. We know what the weather is like in the north of France. We know that it's cloudy and dreary. <laughs> and yet Turner has insisted on showing us this kind of sun-soaked, uh, Southern European, kind of Mediterranean, Italianate, Spanish, harbor view, right? They, they said it's like he was painting Venice. Um, they, they thought it was completely inappropriate. One critic was incensed by Turner's pertinacious adherence to the color yellow, which they thought was completely uh, wrong, right, for, for uh, a Dieppe harbor scene. Um, I think very typical of, of Turner that he uh, didn't care at all about that kind of criticism. In fact, he, he only made his art even stranger, even more abstract and kind of expressionistic as his career went on. Um, this is kind of a wonderful midpoint in his career, just as he's turning toward that uh, abstraction, turning toward that type of expressionism uh, in his art. He's just starting to kind of break the doors down a little bit. Um, he's doing things like painting the sun directly uh, in the sky there, this disc of white paint. Um, 
nobody really did that in 1824. Um, and the sun appears not only there in the sky, but also reflected in the water below. And here, as it's reflected, it, this becomes this wonderful um, opportunity for Turner to, to play with color and light, to express the way that watery surfaces can contain earth tones and green and white and, and reds and, and, and ochres. Um, there's hardly a, a trace of, of blue here in the water, but I think we're still very much convinced of the, of the wateriness of this surface. All the way off to the right here, there's even uh, a, a kind of sewage gutter <laughs> pouring sludge into the harbor. Um, and again, I think very typical of Turner to take what's effectively like a sewage-laden uh, waterway and turn it into this kind of fantasia of, of color and feeling and form, right? Um, we see on the banks of the river, uh, the shores are teeming with people. Uh, perhaps people are, are, are bringing things to sell it at market as though at a kind of flea market. Um, little tiny heads that, that, uh, that dot the street as far as the eye goes. The eyes led very beautifully back into the um, almost infinite vanishing points of these streets. And, and you feel something, I think, of Turner's excitement at arriving in France, at arriving on the European continent and, and traveling throughout the rest of, of Europe. Um, Dieppe was a, a really important um, entry point for, for Britons who were traveling into Europe. Uh, and so this is almost like the capturing the feeling that Turner had as soon as he uh, finally landed, right? And perhaps he was thinking about Venice in his future. Perhaps he was thinking about the Mediterranean, which was stretching out ahead of him. And maybe that's why he painted this scene as such. The next painting uh, I want to show you is, is uh, Veronese's allegory, uh, sometimes called Hercules at the Crossroads. Um, it's known as also as the choice between virtue and vice. Um, this is made around 1565, also in Venice. So we were looking at the St. Francis uh, by Bellini uh, that was made around 1475 in Venice. So this is about a century later, very much in the same tradition. Veronese is famed as a colorist. He's uh, one of these artists that's able to hold um, these jewel-like tones in kind of perfect suspension like this so that you have colors like blue and orange, which are actually opposites on the color wheel, right? They're, they're, they're opposite colors uh, within the space of one uh, uh, outfit here. And then you have the green dress of the woman on the right, the white uh, kind of silk clothing of the man in the center, and this beautiful kind of cobalt and uh, uh, ultramarine sky above, um, everything held together, right? What we're looking at here is, is an illustration from an ancient, uh, of an ancient Greek uh, legend, uh, which tells of Hercules as a young boy or as a young man, um, setting out on his journey, just beginning, and he comes to uh, a fork in the road, and he's choosing which path to take uh, when two women approach him. Each of them is walking down one of the paths. Both, both are very uh, tall and beautiful. Both seem kind of divine, um, and each of them makes an appeal to him. The, the first woman um, has, has, has blonde hair. She's very beautiful. She's wearing flowers in her hair. She has expensive jewelry on her wrists. Um, and she points to the road behind her, which is a, a downhill, very gentle, meandering path, flowers underfoot, um, and says to Hercules, um, follow me, and you will taste all the sweets of life. You will never know any hardship, and you will know happiness, right? And uh, Hercules says to her, what is your name? She says, my friends call me happiness, but those who hate me call me vice. The other woman um, makes her appeal. She points to the road behind her. It's very steep and treacherous and narrow, uh, rocky road, um, dangers around every corner. She says to Hercules, I will not deceive you. I will tell you truly how, how things are. Uh, she says that, that the gods give nothing to humans without toil and effort. If you follow me, you will encounter dangers left and right. But if you go my way, then, then you will know the meaning of true happiness. And Hercules says to her, what is your name? She says, my name is Virtue. Here we see Hercules in the center, this kind of young prince dressed in white satin, white silk. Uh, he appears to be choosing Virtue on the right, leaving vice behind. Uh, but what I love about this painting is if you look really closely at the face of Hercules, um, you know, this hardly looks like the face of somebody who has made up his mind. <laughs> I, I think we're actually catching him in the exact moment of turning back over his shoulder and thinking, maybe it's not too late if I go with vice, actually, that maybe, maybe it's not too late, right? And, and we, we see virtue kind of um, pulling Hercules closer to her saying, you've already made up your mind, let's go, right? She seems, seems a little bit anxious, actually, to, to be on their way, right? 
the details here are uh, exquisite. Um, also, just the way that these faces are painted, it's almost like looking at a Leonardo, this beautiful kind of smoky uh, effect of the face of virtue here, right? Um, virtue wears uh, laurel leaves in her hair, right? Um, which might remind you of uh, Olympian athletes or poets who are held in high honor. She's wearing this uh, floor length um, green gown, green symbolizing nature and, and verdancy and, and perpetuity, right? And she has these very distinctive um, you know, sandal boots, um, military style sandal boots, which might remind you of the goddess Athena, right? Um, Vice could not be more different. Um, she has these beautiful white flowers in her hair. Her hair is very beautifully braided. Uh, the white flowers are identifiable as cyclamen, cyclamen flowers, uh, which are symbolic of love. They're a flower that's often used in, you know, in the Renaissance to make love potions, um, but it's also a poisonous flower. If you put too much in the love potion, it will kill the, the recipient. Uh, so kind of a double-edged uh, sword, right? Um, we might notice that the back of her dress is actually unfastened. We see that the straps are kind of hanging loose. We see some of her undergarments here. We see that she is wearing this very ornate, um, bejeweled uh, dress, right, with gems, precious gems set into it. She has uh, gold bracelets on her wrist. She's holding a pack of cards in her left hand, symbolizing chance, hazard, right? Or maybe a life of idle play, where you just sit around playing cards. Um, and my favorite detail of all uh, is her right hand, which has these very long, very pronounced fingernails. And Veronese, the painter, really wants you to see the fingernails. He's made the thumbnail black so that it stands out against the white of the clothing, but the pinky nail he's made white so that it stands out against the shadow. He's exaggerating these nails, right? Why is that? Well, if we look below, we see what might have happened here. Hercules's calf, the stocking there, is ripped. Uh, he even seems to be bleeding, right? from where he perhaps has been slashed by the, 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 the nails, the sort of talons of this woman, uh, vice, right? Um, so what at first looks like a kind of um, innocuous kind of anodyne scene of uh, three people in beautiful silk clothes in nature um, is actually much more complicated, right? One of these people is actively bleeding <laughs> and kind of fleeing for his life. Um, and yet, and yet he's turning around to, to wonder, maybe I should go with her though, right? It's it's intensely complicated psychologically, right? And I, what I love about this painting is that uh, Veronese doesn't make the, the question simple, virtue or vice, should you live your life on the path of virtue or on the path of vice? Um, it's never so easy as that, I think Veronese is saying, um, that the path of virtue for all that it promises, maybe it's a little bit boring, right? Uh, or maybe the path of vice for all the fun that's promised is is kind of dangerous. Maybe it, it, it means you'll live a shorter life or something, right? Um, it's it's complicated though, and it's always worth kind of discussing, I think. It's as, as fresh a question in the 21st century as it was in the 16th century uh, when Veronese painted it. Um, here in the lower left-hand corner, just to kind of complicate matters, we see also uh, a sphinx, right? So the, the uh, figure of vice seems to be sitting sort of astride this stone statue of a sphinx, um, uh, partially a kind of lion body, and then the, the, the bust and face of a, of a young woman. Um, the, the sphinx is a figure of kind of, of lust and also of, of danger as well. Sometimes they pose riddles and devour you if you get the riddle wrong, right? Um, we also see this massive knife that is concealed from, from Hercules. It's a painting where I think it's really interesting to think about who can see what, right? We cannot see the face of vice, but we can see the face of this sphinx, and the two seem to be joined in this way. Hercules cannot see the face of the sphinx, or he can't see the knife, but he can see the face of vice, right? Um, uh, the, the kind of these three are locked in this kind of um, epic struggle, right? And uh, the arrangement of their bodies is is almost um, balletic, right? There's something kind of beautifully choreographed about this very tense, uh, uh, very compressed scene. Looking at their feet even, we see how close they're all standing to each other, right? Um, uh, almost in this kind of dance, this kind of dangerous dance. Wonderful painting. And so the third and, and, and final picture I want to show you in this room uh, is the great uh, Rembrandt self-portrait of 1658, sometimes called the Frick self-portrait. Um, Rembrandt painted um, more than 40 self-portraits throughout his life. He also made, I think, 30 plus etchings and a number of drawings of himself. Um, he's, he's 
the artist that perhaps more than anyone turned the practice of self-portraiture into a kind of autobiography, right? So, so this is one of the very last uh, self-portraits that Rembrandt made, and it's often considered one of the greatest as well. Um, we see him here in a kind of darkened space, uh, almost emerging from darkness. The, the background, this beautiful kind of earthen dark uh, that surrounds him, seems to almost press down into him. Uh, it, it has a sort of weight in the picture that, um, that does something to, Rem to Rembrandt's body as he sits there. Against that dark background, he's placed an even darker object, um, this uh, beautiful black velvet beret, which has a, a kind of smoky presence atop his head. Um, and it leaves his eyes in this kind of half shadow, right? Which I, I find such an interesting choice to, to, to render the eyes in this kind of flickering darkness and light, right? Uh, the eyes we usually consider the most important part of a, of a portrait, the kind of window into the soul, right? And Rembrandt has chosen to leave those eyes in this kind of um, this kind of play, right? Of, of this kind of curtain of, of light and dark. Um, we see up close that he's painting um, in what's called his his late style, is um, uh, with a kind of roughness and swiftness and a kind of improvisation and spontaneity that might remind you of of the French impressionists, right? Um, this is centuries before the French Impressionists come along, but already Rembrandt is experimenting with this type of paint application. What does it mean if you add a certain velocity to your painting technique, if you um, take all of the skill that you have in rendering things illusionistically uh, and jettison some of that and, and paint instead with a kind of um, immediate uh, vitality that perhaps conveys something truer about the experience of the artist in, in the moment that uh, they're, they're, they're laying the paint down, right? Parts of this um, almost look like abstract expression is painting look like the work of Jackson Pollock right um and it's I, I find it so fascinating that Rembrandt is 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 almost gazing into the future of this medium of oil paint and and shedding light in different avenues and saying what else can this medium do um I often wonder if, if Pollock himself visited the Frick in the 1940s or the 1950s and saw this detail and and felt the kind of permission from from Rembrandt, from the master, to kind of make this the entirety of, of his art, right? Painting with swiftness and gesture. These are all uh, phrases that we used to describe that kind of moment of abstract expressionism in the 20th century. So this is uh, three and a half centuries before that even happens, but Rembrandt is already experimenting with this. We see his hand here. This is his painting hand, uh, a very important uh, hand for Rembrandt. And we see how beautifully he does paint it, that he's still capable of painting with kind of perfect anatomical precision. Each of these knuckles has a little white highlight atop it. Uh, the hand is just is sort of is textbook, right? Um, I especially love the, the sleeve, this white cotton sleeve, which is just a few very quick strokes of the wrist, right? But we see how, how good Rembrandt was at painting at this age, that he could basically paint uh, a, a wrist in his sleep, right? And if you, if, you, if you paint a wrist like this, you know, with just a few flicks of the wrist, um, perhaps you capture something truer about the, the wristness of the wrist, right? You something of the dynamism of the wrist in the moment that it's actually laying the paint down. This, this I think, is what I mean by um, paint saying different things or, or evoking experience in different ways. We might compare Rembrandt's right hand to his left hand over here. And we see, I think, something else entirely, right? Um, off to the right side of this painting, which is darker, um, colors start behaving less rationally. Uh, the hand appears almost abnormally large as well, right? There are even moments where it looks like he's using his fingers to move the paint around, right? Kind of smudge the paint. And again, um, there's a sort of truth in using your hand to paint the hand, right? Kind of almost like making contact with the hand itself, right? Um, in this hand, he's holding this stick, which um, has, has caused some kind of debate among art historians. Some think that it's a mall stick, uh, a tool that painters use to kind of steady their hands while they're painting. You brace it against the side of the canvas and rest your painting hand atop it. Others think that it's a, a walking stick, kind of rattan walking stick with a silver ornament on top, a little silver finial. You see it catching the light there. Whatever the case may be, the way that Rembrandt holds it um, does something for his sense of authority, something for his sense of presence in this picture. It's been said that the way he's painting himself here, um, enthroned in this great chair, facing us squarely, holding this stick uh, crowned with black velvet, that he's painting himself as a king, painting himself as, as king of painters. Um, 
I find this especially interesting because this is only two years after Rembrandt is forced to declare bankruptcy, despite being um, the most famous artist in Europe in his lifetime, um, most successful artist in Europe. Um, he's always you know, teetering on the brink of financial disaster. Um, he has a very reckless collecting habit. He buys paintings and sculptures and, and prints um, and natural curiosities and antiquities and uh, I think he fails to pay the mortgage on his on his grand house on the banks of the canal in Amsterdam as well. So he finally goes under in 1656 at the age of 50. He's forced to sell a lot of his, his exquisite collection at auction. He's forced to move out of his grand home into a smaller house uh, in, in Amsterdam. It's this kind of public humiliation for him. Um, so some Rembrandt scholars think that this self-portrait, which he was painting in the midst of all of that, uh, was intended to be displayed in the front room, the kind of entrance hall of that new smaller house that Rembrandt was forced to move into. So I just, I invite you to imagine what it might have felt like to, to visit Rembrandt in the year 1658, uh, to kind of walk up to the front door full of pity, uh, poor Rembrandt, bankrupt Rembrandt, etc. cetera, uh, and the door swings open, and this is the sight that greets you. I think it would have really quickly shut you up. <laughs> I think it would have really, really quickly reminded you uh, that Rembrandt might be broke, but as long as he has access to his paints, his canvases, his studio, his brushes, um, as long as he lives and breathes, he'll always be supreme amongst painters. He'll always be king of all of us, right? Um, uh, so I find it just an extraordinary act of, of kind of... Um, self-sustenance of kind of spiritual survival in, in the wake of a kind of a financial setback that laid him very low I think um, it's almost like he's he's peering into that darkness and and fending off the kind of uh, the troubles of the world that's around him but but he knows that as long as he can get to the space where he's creating um, he's on his own timeline that that that's his real wealth right that that the particulars of the of, of his finances don't really matter so much to him that he's painting on a different timeline. He's painting into eternity in a sense, right? And it's true that in, in the last decade of his life, after this after this moment, after the setback, um, he would make some of the most sublime and extraordinary work of his entire uh, career. And it's almost like he had to pass through the darkness in order to, to arrive there. So um, I, I, I just, I find this an extraordinary um, place to, to stand and kind of consider the, the life of the artist. And I think it's a wonderful place to, to kind of conclude uh, this, this this tour, um, checking in with Rembrandt. Um, another painting that, you know, every next time you're at the Frick, um, set aside a good 10, 15 minutes to just stand here and take in the uh, the presence of, of this painter. Um, uh, Rembrandt's self-portraits have this incredible power to kind of retain something of his living spirit. Um, uh, the, the painting might almost seem to move before your eyes, seems to come to life. Um, they're, they're wonderful. Uh, wherever you're traveling, if you find out there's a Rembrandt self-portrait in the area, go and, go and see it. Um, it's worth your time. So I, I think um, I'll hold things there. Um, we can open things up for uh, Q&A now. I, I see that there are a few questions in the chat. Yeah. Uh, Emery, yeah, do you, do you want to pose questions and we can have a kind of conversation? Certainly. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you. That was an amazing journey um, through the Frick uh, collection or the Frick building. So thank you so much. Um, and, and your last comment about Rembrandt, I do want to say, um, because at the Getty, uh, where I do research and such, they also have a self-portrait. And I think it's in the eyes. I think that's where he draws you in, yes. you know, regardless of what else is happening in the self-portrait, it's it's his eyes. Exactly. The eyes which have which see uh which look into the mirror, see himself, right? And the eyes which are are the kind of very source of his his own uh, artistry, right? Uh, yeah. looking taking the subjects, uh arranging his his compositions. Um, the eyes are are equally important as the hands, and perhaps even more so. And uh that's where you kind of feel him starting to move, starting to come to life before your own eyes. Yeah. yeah. So we do have a, uh, several questions, and I have I have some as well. Um Great. So the first one that I think everybody wants to know is when will the mansion reopen again? <laughs> yeah, it's a great question. Um, I wish I knew specifically. <laughs> uh, what, what I do know is that um, we'll be open at Frick Madison until March of next year, March 2024. And I think we anticipate reopening at the mansion sometime uh, in late 2024. That's the 
that's the most specific uh, <laughs> language I can provide. But but stay tuned. Uh, keep an eye on the news, and um, I think I think by the end of the year we'll we'll be back. Excellent. So now going back to um, Frick the collector, um, you had mentioned that in the last twenty years he was collecting art. Was that just did it become his hobby? I mean, why why then was if you can give us any insight. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, so um, I think that a lot of the kind of labor disputes actually um, and, and uh, troubles that he got into were, were part of the reason that, that uh, Frick left the steel industry. Um, so uh, he left Pittsburgh where he was headquartered, mm -hmm. um, moved to New York City. And I think from that point onward, um, uh, decided to become almost a kind of um, uh, New York cosmopolite, right? A kind of New York uh, socialite in a sense, right? Um, that Art, I think he saw was a way to sort of um, uh, guarantee himself a kind of legacy, right? And and one that also had a kind of civic quality. Um, you might think about Andrew Carnegie's gospel of wealth in, in this period, this um, this philosophy of kind of making one's millions and then giving it back, right? Uh, doing doing charities uh, for for the future. Um, I think that Frick was very carefully thinking about his legacy and and that. Um, assembling effectively a private uh, museum which which would become open to the public was was for him a way of kind of guaranteeing himself a kind of uh, future for his name um and it has worked i suppose uh, to, to now um and i think has has kind of rehabilitated some some of his legacy i suppose um if 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 one is kind of just glazing over the the history right but um <laughs> we know better <laughs> right as, as as scholars of history and and as i say it's a very recent history it's just a few generations um it's just 100 years or so and uh, I think it's really on us to be very attentive to to that type of history because uh, otherwise, as I say, um, uh, it's easy for things to get to get uh, you know swept under the rug effectively. But um, intensely complicated. It's impossible to write him off entirely. It's impossible to kind of celebrate him absolutely. It's uh, he, he's a complicated man. Well, and I guess it goes into my next question is is and this could be just something we think about. There's no easy answer. Um, but how easily do we forgive the founders of these? beautiful collections, you know, but yet they have that kind of what we would also say that checkered pass, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. with what they leave us, you know, does it mean as time goes by, do we value, do we tend to value the collection, you know, and this is their own life, right? So all of a sudden the legacy, oh, they did leave us all this beautiful art. <laughs> I mean, what are your thoughts? It's a great question. It's a great question. And actually, the Getty Center is a, is a fascinating kind of um, example, right? Because Oh, absolutely. Um, With J John Paul Getty. Absolutely. Right, right. right. Because um, you, you feel the presence of John Paul Getty at the Getty Villa, right? Which was the sort of original Getty. Uh, right. It used to be uh, his, his home. But if you go to the Getty Center now um, in, in, in Brentwood, then uh, you almost see no traces of of the founder at all, um, apart from just the name, right? Um, and it's a different example of of kind of um, the collection, as you say, becoming more and more foregrounded over time, uh, and and the kind of history of the uh, or biography of the founder kind of receding a little bit, right? Um, I, I wonder if such a thing is is possible within the the space of a house museum like this, where it's very emphatically a domestic space. Um, I don't think that you could walk into the living hall and and not wonder about. The person who lived here so oh, the parameters are, are are different but um as i say it, it, it's not a matter of um i don't think it's a matter of, of of canceling people or of kind of writing them off i think it's just um an invitation to look more closely at the history right uh, to see that um every history is layered and complicated and um it's not about one thing forgiving the past deed it's about the two things happening uh in, in conversation, right? It's it's we, we can't ever extricate the uh, the difficulties of this history from the, the 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 kind of the good stuff. I think it's it's all part of it, right? And it's really on us to be attuned to the complexity uh, and to kind of understand it better, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So here's another uh, question that came in: um, that how did he know what to purchase? Um, so the three parts. We'll do the first part. Did he have someone to help him? He did, yeah. He had some of the very best uh, art dealers advising him in both uh, New York and in London. People like Joseph Duveen, uh, Nerdler, Charles Carstairs. Um, uh, he had a kind of wonderful uh, cadre of, of, of elite advisors um, who had their eyes on the very best stuff that was coming up on the market and would wire Frick immediately because they knew that he had an enormous appetite for, for this type of art and also an enormous budget as well. So he was kind of at the top of their client lists. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, another question. Well, okay. So the second part to that is, did he 
uh, with the advice, I guess, of these um, um, dealers, did he go for actual artists or did he really just choose themes that appealed to him? And I'm thinking more about the, the living hall. You mm -hmm. have El Greco, you have mm -hmm. Titian, you have Bellini, you have Holbein. Yeah. I mean, any one of those paintings would be like, like a, 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 a collection highlight at any other museum. And you have all of these in just one room from a private collector. Exactly. So what, what was it? Was it, is it subject matter or artists or just really the, on the advice? Here we are back in the living hall, just so we can have a look at it yeah. uh, while we talk. Um, I, I mean, I, I really think it's um, it's a bit of everything. Um, what's interesting to note about this collection is the way that it's very heavy on portraiture. Um, we know that Frick had a, had a kind of uh, a taste for portraits of famous individuals, um, be they Thomas More and Thomas Cromwell or King Philip IV of Spain. Um, or, 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 or famous uh, great men of painting as well, like, like Titian and, and Bellini and El Greco, right? So um, that's one aspect of the identity of the collection that, that kind of um, comes across, I think, subtly, the more time you spend with this. Uh, we know that he also liked to have a lot of landscapes, right? So we saw the, the Turners. He also has landscapes by Habama and Constable. Um, Frick wanted pictures that were, in his language, uh, easy to live with. Uh, so it, it might strike you as kind of interesting uh, that the collection, which is very strong on, on Western art history, old master art, contains almost no scenes of violence, wow. almost no nudity also, right? And it's kind of hard to filter out all that stuff if you're looking, at, usually if you're looking at old master art, right? But somehow Frick has been able to do that, right? He wanted, I guess he wanted pictures that you could have your like breakfast bowl of cereal and not kind of like, you know, <laughs> being a total fit or frenzy, uh, you know, as you do that, right? Um, so interesting that that his collecting sensibility comes across in that way. Um, but he was also acting very much, I think, on the advice and encouragement of his dealers and art historians, preeminent art historians of the day who were, who were saying, this is extremely important. You cannot pass up this opportunity. Even if you have to pay half a million dollars for this Rembrandt self-portrait, you must, you must, you must acquire it, right? Did he uh, travel to Europe to be first exposed to these? I mean, um, and bring anything home from those travels? Yeah, a good question too. He, he did travel uh, extensively in Europe. And I think a lot of his um, education in art, art, art history uh, happened that way, right? So he visited the great collections of Europe, um, the Prado, uh, the Louvre, the National Gallery. He visited places like the Wallace Collection in London, which is almost a kind of a, uh, gave him the blueprint of a house like like uh, the Frick Mansion. Uh, a lot of the decoration and furnishing and and uh, uh, collect uh, same artists that are represented in that collection too. Um, so he, he did, yeah, he, he traveled extensively. And uh, I think that was a way for him of kind of envisioning this, the sort of uh, house and museum that he himself wanted to, to to leave to the public, yeah. And so you say that word public because I do find it very interesting how he put entire public, mm -hmm. and at, almost as if, do you think he put that word entire to not let people interpret their idea of public? Because mm -hmm. public is very different now than it was, you know, when he passed away. Yes. Exactly, and and it's interesting even just to note during the um, the years that the Frick has been open to the public, so since 1935, uh, the way that the admission policy has actually changed. Um, so I think that right after the Frick opened to the public, quote unquote, um, you still needed letters of recommendation uh, in order to kind of gain admission. Right, you had to know somebody, and they had to vouch for you to to, to be admitted. Right. Um, that was relaxed over the years, right? Um, uh, children are still not permitted to enter the collection, right? You have to be 10 years old to, to, to go to the Frick. Uh, sometimes people, when they when they turn 10 in New York City, they go to the Frick as a way of kind of celebrating. Um, but so uh, absolutely, this idea of, of, of public, quote unquote, could, could definitely have been interpreted very differently. I think that adding the word entire to that was a way of kind of just uh, guaranteeing that it, it, it wasn't a kind of uh, stricted uh, kind of stricture, uh, a stricter version, a stricter interpretation of that. And, and nowadays, um, we in the education department think 
quite a lot uh, about that language and um, try to uh, create as many free programs as possible, free nights, uh, first Fridays, as it's called a monthly kind of free program at the Frick, free drawing programs, free conversation programs, um, ways of making the Frick uh, really truly live up to that language, I suppose, of, of being open to the entire public. Um, the museum is located on the Upper East Side in New York in a very kind of elite uh, zip code. Um, so it, it can seem, I think, very intimidating um, or foreboding, I suppose, uh, especially for uh, visitors who have never been to museums before or, or visitors who are not used to being in spaces like this. But uh, it's really our work at the museum today to, to, to extend that welcome as warmly as possible to make these doors as wide open as, 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 we, as we possibly can. Yeah. And, and I will say, because I, I um, do some uh, gallery docent work and I work at the education department at the Getty, but that is also on the forefront for them as well. For them, you know, being with such a huge endowment and the responsibility of that endowment to be inviting to all. And so have you seen this? Because in, in my art history classes, we do talk about the role of the museum. So have you seen, I mean, I guess Mr. Frick, he kind of laid that already out for you, as opposed to other museums who has have who have had to discover that mm -hmm. by saying the entire public, he's like, okay, this is the role of this museum. Yeah, that's really true. It, it makes it a lot easier in some sense, right? That it's kind of just just take it and go forth, and and just, and just uh, there's we, it, it, there's no complication about it, right? And, and there's also other uh, lovely language in the will talking about um, the institution being a place for the gathering of of ideas and 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 discourse on on kindred subjects as well. And so that has informed the way that the Frick has created a kind of famous lecture series um, about the history of art, but also about uh, other arts, about literature and so forth. Um, T.S. Eliot gave a famous talk in 1943 about Paradise Lost, about, about the, the poetry of John Milton, famously was attended by Georgia O'Keeffe and, and lots of other artists and luminaries of, of the day. So um, it's nice when the will does contain good <laughs> language and makes things a lot simpler, I guess, for the future. Yeah. Yeah. You could just say, I'm sorry, Mr. Frick said. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. There's, there's no bones about it, right? Yes. So I do have um, an observation I wanted to share about the dining room when we were looking at um, uh, the portrait of uh, the young lady uh, with the blue dress. And forgive me for not having, um, because what I, was interesting that caught my eye when you were talking about how Gainsborough is kind of foreboding or, or kind of telling a little bit about her background. If you look at how the tree in the bottom left kind of cuts across her dress. Yes. And I found that interesting as well because typically in a portrait, you don't cut anything out, you know, of the main figure. True. Um, I mean, so, so to me, that also says like something's not quite right with her or she hasn't lived this very um virtual you know life that that the other part might share i mean wh what are your yeah. thoughts no that's really that's a really a great observation that the, the this branch very yes. forcefully interrupts the portrait right it's it's kind of strange when you when you realize that there's a a, a branch that's right in our way <laughs> you know it interrupts the dress it kind of it, it it breaks across the train maybe it's a way for Gainsborough to say that that she is indeed in motion that she's walking somewhere her dress is trailing out behind her you see it going past the branch mm -hmm. I, I think that the branch also uh, helps us kind of enter the background of the of the, yes. of the painting as well right that it, it takes us from the foreground here and kind of leads the eye upward and into the space of this background where we see this little temple. This, they're called follies, actually, a little architectural folly, like a miniature um, ornamental building that you would see on the uh, grounds of uh, English estates. Funny that there's a little sculpture, sculptural figure there in that temple. Yes. Maybe that gives you a sense of like other human presence in the area, right? Which we feel by her gaze as well. Um, and then, and I think that we might continue from there all the way up into the clouds, which are, as, it, as we were saying earlier, so strange and kind of turbulent and, uh, you know, it looks like rain is about to start falling, right? So maybe the, the tree is a sort of an entry point for us as well into the kind of the full world of the picture as well. I love it. I love it all. Um, so here's another question that came in. Um, what was the uh, Froganard room used for during uh, Mr. Frick's time living there? A, a really good question as well. Um, so um, part of it is guesswork. Um, we, based on some, some photographs, some kind of archival photographs of the room from the 1920s, um, we know that the furniture was arranged kind of differently. Um, so the house has been, has been kind of um, 
museified in a lot of ways, right? So a lot of the furniture has been pushed up against the walls and uh, the space has been cleared in the, in the centers of rooms to, to create the space for the for, for visitors, right? Um, but we know that um, the Fragnard room was used as a sort of sitting room, um, that it was a kind of, um, if say the living hall where with those heavy wood panels was used as a kind of uh, men's retiring room after dinner, um, we think that perhaps the Fragnard room, room was a kind of uh, for, for, for the ladies after, after dinner. Um, we also know that um, the Fricks hosted concerts here in the Fragnard Room, and it's a kind of perfect uh, acoustic space, actually, for for um, small kind of chamber music or solo musicians. Uh, when you put the wooden parquet floors together with these canvases on the walls, they kind of perfectly dampen the sound and, and create this beautiful kind of acoustic uh, space. So um, it's a room that kind of adjoins the Fifth Avenue Garden itself. It gets really beautiful light. Um, you see the way that these mirrors that are set into the walls um, kind of cast the eye in many different directions. They bring the outdoors inside. They multiply the light. Um, it's a very kind of whimsical and, and wonderful space where um, you, you sometimes can't tell if you're looking at a mirror or reality or paintings uh, or the garden outside, which is being brought in. Um, it's, it's, it's wonderful that it all kind of spins in this way. Um, but those are, I guess, is a sort of sitting room um, and, and a kind of concert space as well. Just lovely to think about. Thank you so much. And then I was also intrigued. And first of all, thank you for sharing us the stairwell and then the upstairs. Okay. That was mm -hmm. beautiful and fascinating. And I actually love how he has his Vermeers just walking down the hall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So did he, I guess, in, in placing the art, um, did he have any notion of like, oh, I should place this one here because it's a more prominent artist? Or did he just really put them kind of where he felt that they just kind of fit in? Yeah, it's that's a really great question too. Um, he he tried things in different places. Um, so actually, um, the, the the great Rembrandt self portrait that we were looking at at one point uh, it was in it was in the dining room. Um, I think right after after he acquired it, maybe he wanted to see it over dinner every night. He was so proud of it, uh, so happy to have it. Right. Um, so things did move around. He did try things in different spaces. So this is the dining room now with um. Uh, with the English portraits. This is kind of the installation that he returned to, he kind of settled on. Um, but if I go to, let's see, if I go to the uh, South Hall here. That's amazing. Uh, right, so here are those uh, Vermeers that are kind of in this pass-through space, this corridor uh, that gets you to the living hall through that doorway. Um, um, different paintings were here actually during Frick's lifetime. Uh, we know that um, the Turner Harbor actually used to be at the, at the base of the staircase here. So things have moved around. Um, and one of the uh, things that's different about the Frick as compared to other house museums, like say the Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, um, is that things can still move. Um, that oh. the curators have a lot of um, liberty in deciding, um, should we try this somewhere else? Should we, should, does this look better here? Should we have a, uh, one, one fewer painting on the wall, et cetera? Um, at the Gardner, everything is, is exactly where Isabel Stewart Gardner left it, and uh, there's a different kind of engagement with um, with the past in that way. But uh, one of the benefits of being able to move things is that you can kind of update um, uh, things based on kind of changing uh, installation taste, right? So that um, in in the West Gallery, and I'll I'll kind of return there. Um, in in Frick's lifetime, this actually used to be hung with uh, about twice the amount of, of paintings, uh, double. Um, and small paintings were placed actually above the larger paintings in this upper register, uh, salon style as it's called, where you have this kind of um, almost, you know, carpeting the walls with paintings. Um, nowadays, we've kind of decided that it makes it kind of impossible to see little paintings. Actually, the Vermeer used to be up above paintings here in, in this room. Uh, and it's kind of impossible to see them up close uh, or satisfyingly if they were way up there. So. Um, the curators were able to kind of update things a bit, kind of space the paintings out a little bit more, create a little bit more of a kind of um, oxygen in the room, I suppose, and uh, allow you to see things more closely. Excellent. And then um, I also want to thank you for sharing an, uh, about the organ, um, oh, yeah. because I do know that must have been a trend with these big houses, because there's also an organ such as that at the George Eastman house mm. over in Rochester, um, New York. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Where yes, they would bring somebody in for the parties and would be playing the organ, you know, as as music. So I found that yeah. very interesting. And then yeah. my one of my last questions, and um, 
is about the architecture and what caught my eye when we were going up to the stairwell to the mm -hmm. second floor it reminded me of some of the interiors of the houses over at Newport. Mm -hmm. Did did uh, the Frick family have any presence in Newport? Because that would have been also another thing to do with you know high society at that time. Yes, I, I think that they did travel uh, to, to Newport and kind of visited with families there. Um, the Fricks also had a kind of vacation home in Pride's Crossing, Massachusetts. So uh, I think it would have been on the way uh, for them. Um, yes. and we know that that Frick. Um, traveled via private Pullman car to to his um, kind of summer home um, and actually would would take a number of his paintings with him via private Pullman car. Um, so fascinating, right, that, that the collection was so part of his psyche that he couldn't actually be away from him, um, even if it's just for a summer. Um, really interesting. Um, but but yes, um, I, I think that there uh, all the kind of elite families in this period in the Northeast were certainly in conversation with each other. So be it kind of um, interior decoration or sure. um, or having an organ built into the house. I think that um, uh, these these are all ideas that are kind of part of the part of the exchange, part of the parlance, right? Yes. Um, the, the organ, I'm sure, um, the fact that the organ is, uh, was called by Mozart king of instruments, I think that would not have been lost on on Frick the opportunity to have. Um, uh, as, as himself a kind of king of industry, right? Uh, this this magnificent instrument in his house. The Fricks did seem to love music and having concerts and um, putting an organ here, I think is a, is a sort of a signature way of, of recognizing that fact. Right? And then here's this last question, but it is, it's an intriguing one. And I don't know if the Frick ever really has to do with this because he like purchased these, you know, we have records, but um, how do you feel about paintings um, being returned to the countries where they were produced. I mean, I, I don't think you, you all necessarily have to deal with that much again, because it's a collection that you know, you know, you have bill of sales for and, and such. Mm -hmm. But has that ever come up with with the Frick? Yeah, the question of, of repatriation, right? It's yeah. it's a it's an intensely important one and um not not easy, right? Um it's, it's true that the, the paintings at, at the Frick were acquired through quote unquote legitimate means and we have the papers and provenances and so forth, but um, is that still to say that they weren't at some point kind of uh, 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 arrested from their homelands in some way, right? Um, we know that a lot of works of art have, have been literally stolen, right? So that's another matter entirely, right? And um, collections like the Metropolitan Museum are, are, are really reckoning with, with, with that fact, especially um, because of the, the history of these uh, kind of looting of these works of art is so intimately uh, tied to colonialism and kind of the kind of colonial extraction of other resources as well, right? Um, so I, I think it's an important, extremely important um, conversation on, that's ongoing that, that must be had. I think um, opponents of repatriation would say that if, if, you, if you take them and put them back in some small museum where they're from, then nobody sees them. But the question I would pose is who, who, who is meant by nobody, right? Um, who's, who's to define who is somebody and who is nobody in that kind of uh, situation, right? Um, so um, this happens, you know, uh, the, the Elgin Marbles, right, in, in London at the British, yeah. British Museum, uh, returning to Greece and so forth. Um, I, I'm really, I'm really happy to to see the the conversation kind of um, become, I think, ever more lively and ever more kind of intense. Um, I think that this question of of um, of who has the right to see what, uh, and 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 whose rights are kind of privileged over others, is is one that has a lot of uh, kind of light to shed on, on not just the practice of collecting art, but uh, on all aspects of our of our society um, in a kind of post colonial wor world. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, um, Vincent, thank you so much um, from the student comments. They just truly appreciate you taking us on this visual tour of the actual Frick, in addition to the art. Um, we're all excited. So maybe we're going to have a school trip to the Frick <laughs> That'd be next wonderful. year, perhaps. <laughs> That'd be great. Maybe back, back at the house itself. That'd be really wonderful. That's right. Couldn't you see us, students? We could all have like a, a, a I hope I hope we have private, private, um, events but could you imagine us all having like a little tea or cocktail oh, hour nice. out there by the magnolia trees <laughs> we'll have a little concert in the fragonard room <laughs> there, there and there you go as we walk into the fragonard room great. well again thank you. thank you so much uh vincent this was a fabulous uh, presentation we truly appreciate your time and students again feel free to continue the discussion and your comments as they open up um in canvas in about five minutes for the discussion board and then leaving your thoughts and impressions. So everyone have a great week. Thank you so much and take care.